Hi, my name is Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us here today to talk about birds. I'm going to tell you, start by saying a little bit about Phoenix Landing. This class was developed by Phoenix Landing volunteers and Phoenix Landing has been in existence for 20 years. A lot that we know about birds has changed over the last 20 years. So we're always updating these classes. They're really designed for both new, people who are new to birds as well as people who are really seasoned bird owners. And we learn together about birds as well. More and more information comes available. We have helped over 3,000 birds since our founding 20 years ago because adoption is an important part of what we do. Education is another important part of what we do. So that's just a little nutshell. You can go to phoenixlanding.org to learn more and to also see some of our upcoming events. So many events are now offered online, of course, in this new changing world that we're living in. So this talk, No Place Like Home, it seems like a good time to, um, we've had this class actually for a couple years. It's been updated a couple times, but now, since more people are staying home, it seems like home is something everyone is thinking about, right? People are working from home, they're getting groceries delivered more often, things like that. So we think about what does the word home mean to you? Home is really, you know, a place for health. We want to be healthy, right? We want opportunities to be healthy. We want safety. Home should be a safe place. It should be a safe, comfortable place. A place where there's family or your bird, a sense of flock and opportunity. So we want to be comfortable and have challenges and have new things to learn and new ways to grow in our homes, don't we? We want those same things for our birds, right? So when we think about what we want for our birds environment, this is kind of the way we're going to structure the talk. We're going to talk about creating a nice home for our birds, a place where they can be healthy, safe, have a sense of family or flock, and have opportunities and challenges so they can learn and grow just like we want to learn and grow. So we'll start out this first video segment. We're going to focus on home being a place for health and all the things we can do to keep our birds healthy. The first and a very important part, of course, is having a good avian veterinarian. Our avian veterinarians are our best partners in keeping our birds healthy. So I really encourage you to think about your relationship with your vet as a partnership. It's one of the most important things we can do because avian vets have very specialized knowledge. Birds are so different from dogs and cats. Their anatomy is very different. The way medicines, you know, impact them, very different. So we need someone, you need a vet who is going to keep up with that and do some continuing education on birds because again, avian medicine is changing just like all kinds of medicine are changing. It's really our bet bird's best insurance policy because by the time our birds look sick, often they are really sick. And in part, that is because they are prey animals. So everything about them, they try to hide illness. To them, that is how they protect us. Because if you have a member of a flock and they're in the wild, a bird that shows signs of illness is putting the whole flock in danger. It's attracting attention of predators. That is a really hard thing for us to relate to, isn't it? Because we're mammals and we're predators and we don't mind whining if we aren't feeling well. And that is foreign, that would be foreign to a bird. That's just not how they are wired. So they really try to hide illness. 
And there's an assignment after this. You can search for a vet, and that's one of the things we're going to ask you to do to find what vets are near you. There's the Association of Avian Veterinarians, which is a wonderful source. And there's also the um, there's also a link to the board certified vets, and you can also search there and find what vets are in your area. If you need one, I encourage you to go ahead and program your phone, even if you don't have a bird yet, and um, so that you're ready and you're prepared. So some of the things that our vets will do, of course, is provide regular exams. We recommend annual exams, and for a healthy bird, do lab work and blood work every other year. If you, your bird has any kinds of concerns though, if there's liver issues or other things, your vet may want to do blood work every year. So definitely something to work with on your vet, vet with your vet. Um, microchips to keep track of them in case anything happens and you get separated from them. They can do nail trims and other trims as needed. Of course, Wings to clip or not to clip is a personal decision. Um, we will say one thing that we're learning a lot is how important exercise is to our bird's health. So if you can keep a bird flighted and safely permit flight in your home, that is a wonderful way for them to exercise and an important part of exercise because there's nothing, no other kinds of exercise that they can do that's going to give them quite the, the workout that flying will. So I know for many, many years, it was really, really ingrained in us that if we want to keep our birds safe, we have to keep them clipped. And what that maybe is doing is actually leading to, we have all these birds that have atherosclerosis or hardened arteries or heart disease because they're not getting enough exercise. So it's one of those things that is evolving as we know more, right, about birds and learn more about birds. So if you can safely provide flight in your home, um, it's a wonderful thing to do. And of course, our vets are very, very important for emergencies too. Now we all know that birds are not like cars. So there's no manual that can give a fix for everything. So I also just want to put a little, you know, have a little side note that if something horrible does happen with your bird, a lot of, sometimes I know by the time the bird, because birds do hide illness, by the time they show illness and we take them to the vet, the bird doesn't make it. And our vets can try everything possible, but these, this is just some of the tragedies of life. Just remember your vet and the vet team is our people too. And it's a very hard thing for them to go through to you lose a client as well. So I just encourage you to be sensitive to that as well as, you know, I'm, your vet will be sensitive when you lose, if, if, if that happens, if you lose a bird that way. So back to <laughs> more information though. When to see a vet immediately if you have bleeding that won't stop now, I, I will also say if you do, if it's a nail, um, you can use septic powder on nails. If there is a feather or something on the skin that is not bleeding, do not use septic powder on the skin. Septic powder or quick stop, I think is one of the brand names, um, burns. So it's, it's not good to put it, it can actually do some I understand some serious damage to their skin and their follicles. So cornstarch or flour and pressure you can apply to try to get blood to stop on your own. If it will not stop, you need to see a vet immediately. Of course, if there's injuries, bites, burns, poisons, or crop impaction, if you get a cat, a cat bite, um, bacteria, a bird needs to see a vet and get antibiotics within a few hours. That is an emergency. Crop impaction, because some I've gotten that question, what is a crop impaction at times? If they have ingested things that it could cause a blockage. So be, be aware of that. If your bird stops eating, um, or if your bird is sitting or laying on the bottom of the cage, again, they're gonna hide signs of illness. So if they are looking really sick, they are really sick. 
if they're seeing, seeming lethargic, if there's a big change in behavior like that. And egg binding, if they seem to be really straining or again, kind of either sitting in a bowl and straining or at the bottom of the cage, something could be stuck. But, and if you know, that's a good reason to know if you have a male or female and a lot of our birds we can't tell by looking at them so it requires a blood test so that's another thing it's information to have so that if you do have an emergency your vet can say hmm could this be a reproductive issue or egg binding or oh no we know that bird is a male it's not that let's go to you know look at other things that it could be not going to go over all the, the illnesses in detail here, but this is just kind of an FYI. Be aware of some of the, the common diseases and things that our birds could be, could, could impact our birds. Um, psittacosis is something that is zoonotic, which means it can be transferred to and from humans too. And sometimes there's no signs um, in the bird. So just something to be aware of. And if you have someone in your home who gets it, you know, have the bird checked. It could be something that you could treat your bird for as well. And thinking also, you know, about other issues, you know, aspergillosis is all around us. Um, but sometimes if a bird, something else is impacting their immune system, they'll be more susceptible for it to, to impact them. It's also one of the reasons that, especially with multiple birds, make sure good husbandry, good husbandry practices are in place in cleaning. You don't want them, you know, interacting with a lot of their own poop or someone else's poop. And of course, um, sexual contact is a way birds can transfer illness to each other. So quarantining new birds, will hopefully minimize the risk of disease spread. We recommend four weeks for a new bird coming into your house, longer if there's any issues or if you can't get them to a vet sooner. Um, in our homes, it's really hard to do a true quarantine unless you have more than one HVAC system. And I know some homes do, they have zones upstairs and downstairs, and that would be a great way to quarantine them is even have them in different air systems. But if you can't do that, if you don't have a home, at least you, know, you can have them in another room if possible. Um, and take care of your birds first before taking care of the other bird. If you're in a studio apartment, then just you know, try to do social distancing. We try to do as much as we can as far as minimizing, keeping them far apart. Take care of your guys first, then wash up, and then take care of the new guy. Um, so hopefully you're not taking anything that the new bird could have and bringing it to your own. So we have responsibilities in um, taking care of them too, right, at home. So one of the things that we can do is just do regular weight checks with our birds. Now, you can weigh them weekly and weigh them about the same time of day because their weight is going to vary by multiple grams throughout the day. So you want to try to, to try to kind of compare weights based on what they normally eat in a day, do it at the same time of day. If you can do it first thing in the morning before they've had breakfast, that's a great time to try to get a baseline and compare. If there's a big weight loss, um, that can be one of the first signs of illness before they even ever begin to look ill and get them ready to go to the vet. If you can do some positive reinforcement, make going into a carrier a really happy, positive thing because they're used to getting walnuts or almonds there or whatever is motivating to your bird. If you can teach them to take juice or other things out of a syringe, it's another nice behavior for them to be comfortable with before they might have to take medicine out of a syringe. I will add that some medicines are really, really bitter. So if they're used to getting a little bit of cranberry juice out of a syringe, they might be really disappointed if they get Batril. Um, but if you can, you know, try to reinforce it with maybe have a chaser, a cranberry juice chaser afterwards or a, whatever their favorite treat is after they have that, that Batril um, as a reward 
that would be a, you know one way to try to keep that behavior uh, fluid and firm. Um, also, if they can be used to a towel, it could even be just getting treats for seeing a towel, um, getting treats for stepping onto a towel before the towel touches them, let them touch it. You want to go through some small steps, increments. So, you know, rewarding them all the way to get them comfortable with these things. Baby steps all the way. Of course, watching their content of their poop. Um, we end up having to be poopologists when we have birds and watching for changes in their droppings. So the three parts of the poop, you have urine, which we also have, it's the more watery part that you see. Um, they also have feces, which is usually the more solid and colored part. If they, and the color can vary depending on what they have been eating. If they've been eating a lot of pellets or on primarily a pellet diet, it'll probably be more brown in color. If they eat a lot of fresh fruits and veggies, the color is probably gonna be more like a green. If they've been eating blueberries or pomegranate seeds, you might be seeing some you know, brighter colors in there. And knowing what is normal for your bird, if they have just taken a shower, it may be more watery at that time. So, but know what your, the range of droppings are like for your bird and you know monitor that for changes because big changes there can also be those subtle signs before they ever show signs of illness that something is happening and of course cleaning regularly with bird safe products husbandry can help you know at least decrease the opportunities for some of these things and changing papers every day, that gives you right there an opportunity to monitor those droppings to make sure that they are looking normal. And having an emergency first aid kit on hand in case anything does happen and knowing where it is. Um, know your bird, know what the normal behavior is, what their appetite is like, what their weight is, their voice is. Sometimes a change in if they're not playing with his toys as much, and there could be a change of be in behavior, their voice can change, and that can be a sign that maybe there's something going on, a fungal infection or something. So just know what's normal and listen to that gut if something is off. Here are some things to have in your emergency kit, um, some things you may want to have in there. And if you don't have a vet your veterinarian's number and whatever, wherever you would go, if it's an emergency at midnight on Christmas, um, you know, go ahead, look that up, program it into your phone now. We use um, keep Arnica cream. You don't want to put Arnica on a wound, but you can put it on a bruise. It decreases the bruising. We actually use it at the adoption center if someone does get bitten. We hope you are not getting bitten, but it's a good thing to have on hand in case um, for yourself. <laughs> um, putting it on a, a bite can help decrease, the. It, it will heal more quickly. And there's a bunch of other items listed here too. Of course, again, I'd already mentioned a little bit about using cornstarch or flour for bleeding um, over the instead of the um, septic powders, especially if it's on skin. And you wanna make sure you keep something, to, you have something to keep your bird warm if your bird is appearing um, ill. Something that a lot of people wanna do is if your bird is, is kind of lethargic and you know showing that they're not feeling well, we are mammals, we wanna pick them up and cuddle them, right? That is actually the worst thing you can do. Um, and that's something to, to think about. This behavior, this cuddling behavior is a very mammal thing for one. And if a bird is trying to fight off an illness, they may just need their space. And two, our body temperature is lower than a bird's normal body temperature. And of course, heat goes to the source. If you actually are making your bird colder if we try to use our body to increase their temperature. So the best thing to do is actually put them um, near a heating pad or a heating lamp. Just make sure that they can move if they get overheated so they can step away from the heating pad or the heating lamp. But um, that is a, the better way to keep them warm.
I thought that was interesting, you know, <laughs> when I learned that. Okay, so um, exercise too. We talked a little bit for health. We need exercise just like we are, you know, I know I really should exercise more than I do. It's a great thing for us to do for our birds' health too is give them opportunities for exercise. So everything about our birds were built for flight. It's a very natural behavior. So I encourage you, if you can, um, allow your birds to fly inside. Active birds are healthier. They're going to have healthier bones, healthier hearts, um, all of that. So consider giving them chances to exercise and to move. If, and this is another good thing about giving them choices. Give them multiple places to go in the room and don't, if they can fly, um, let them fly there. If they can't fly, set up a road system. It could be hanging rope perches or something so that they can climb over there. Um, but encourage them to exercise and go to those places it could be a climbing net, you know, that you can use to link multiple places for your bird in a room, but make them move, you know, um, by, by not always being their transportation system. Encourage them to go there on their own. Of course, give them the largest cage possible. There is no such thing as a cage that is too big. When you go to see them in the wild, you realize your house is not too, is too small, you know? <laughs> when we really look at it, the big picture, we do the best we can, right? We have to work with the homes we have. But give them as large a cage as possible and birds move horizontally. They, you know, a lot of cages are narrow and tall and birds don't tend to go just up and down. Those are designed for our living rooms. They're designed for people. They're not designed for the birds. So give your bird as much, you know, um, horizontal space as you can and lots of places to go in that cage and things to do. Recommend hanging two moving like action toys in a cage at least. And those could be those spiral rope um, like bungees. I think they, they, boings they call them or uh, swings, you know, have multiple, have at least two of those in the cage so they have to move. Target training is a great activity to do with your bird. And if you don't know what I mean by that, it sounds weird, doesn't it? Um, what all that is, is training your bird to touch a target. And that could be a chopstick. It could be a pen. It could be your finger. It could be your thumb. Um, but to make them, get them to move and touch something. And by teaching that behavior, you can get them to do some training and, and move around. You can do it even while they're inside the cage and you're outside of it to get them to move around it. You can get them to move around the room in your home or even fly around the house um, once that's a really good solid behavior. Give them lots of toys to play with and interact with. And if you have aviaries or a place, you know, cage on a porch, that's a wonderful thing to do as well, to have for them as well. So. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that fresh air and sunshine. Um, so yes, and if you can have, if you have an outdoor aviary, it's wonderful for them. Um, you know, we all need some fresh air. It's important for their bone health too. And uh, calcium absorption, especially in African grays, they're finding. So they need the UV rays, UVA and UVB. And the windows in our home, having just access to sunlight through windows does nothing for that because it doesn't, it blocks out the UVA and UVB that the birds need. So it could be just a few minutes a day outside. Um, it could be taking them out. Uh, one volunteer made a, this cage stroller, cajoler, um, which essentially is a travel cage put on top of a, a stroller that she picked up like at Goodwill. Um, so a used stroller so you can make your own and take them for a walk around the neighborhood. So you can, if nothing else though, you can even, if you have a travel carrier, bring them outside in the travel carrier and let them look around, get some fresh air, sunshine. 
whenever you take them outside, we always have to be alert for predators. And temperatures, actually the heat is often more problematic than the cold for the birds. So with the outdoor aviaries here at the adoption center, we always make sure there's a place in the aviary that's shaded and that they always have access to water. If your bird gets overheated, that is a problem. So make sure they always have a way to get out of the heat. We, and also a lot of the question we get often is how cold can they go out? We'll even let them out when the temperature is in the 50s, you know, here, but it depends on what your bird is used to. If your bird has never gone outside before, I wouldn't take them from the 80 degree house into an aviary that when it is, you know, 55 degrees outside, it's stepping stone. If they're used to going out when it's 80 and then when it's in the 70s and then when it's in the 60s, you know, they're probably okay when it's with the 50s. It gives their feathers chance to acclimate too you actually may notice a difference in the thickness of their feathers over time if a bird is going out more. So just some things to be aware of. Um, in clipped wings, we don't recommend taking a bird outside just without a carrier or anything because the wings are clipped because they can fly off very easily. Um, I think sometimes clipped wings is, it's, it gives us a false sense of security and lots of birds do fly off of clipped wings. So we recommend still going out with a stroller. Lots of people ask us about harnesses. Um, you know, there's still a risk there of them getting away in a harness or chewing through it. And you also have to just recognize that it takes a lot of training to get them into and out of so that they're comfortable in a harness too. So it's just all things to consider when you're thinking about how to take your birds outside to get that fresh air and sunshine. Okay, so of course they also need opportunities for bathing. Bathing is very, very important. Don't we all, you know, need a good shower? It is important for their feather health. It helps relieve stress. Um, it occupies time. And it can also help calm some behavior in some birds. So it really depends, different birds like different bathing options. Some are more bowl bathers. Some or prefer to be misted or to go into the shower. It seems like a lot of conures that come through the adoption center, not only like a bowl, but like a little drip of water going into a bowl. So if you're doing dishes in the sink and the bird suddenly comes over and wants to um, take a bath, you know, if you can safely allow them to do that, I wouldn't have a big, deep pan of water that they could, you know, hurt themselves in. But, um, you know, if you can set it, set aside some time and let them take a little bath, uh, that's great. Some birds also, the vacuum cleaner inspire, inspires them to, to bathe. So the roar of the vacuum cleaner may inspire them to jump into a bowl or spread their wings and want to be misted. So you can pay attention to that too. Sometimes that can be used to encourage them to bathe. Also think about good nutrition. That's important. Food. It's one of our, a lot of our favorite topics, right? You know, food is, is important. Um, so think about having a well-rounded, diverse diet. You want lots of different vitamins and minerals. I will say, especially, um, think about vitamin A. We've gotten a lot of birds that came in, have come in to us that were on a majority of the pellet diet that were vitamin A deficient. And a vet can tell if they're vitamin A deficient just by looking in their mouth. And at the, um, the um, papilla on the roof of their mouth. So foods that are rich in vitamin A include pumpkin, um, mango, uh, those dark leafy greens. If it's got a dark, rich color, you know, sweet potato. So I definitely encourage uh, pomegranate seeds. You know, it's just, you know, think about incorporating some of those foods into their diet. And of course, make it fun. We all like food different ways, right? Um, you know, you can make it a little challenge. And I, I've, I've known some birds that 
if you put it in a bowl in front of them, maybe they won't try something new, but if they have to forage for it and work for it, they're more apt to try it. So presentation can be everything. Um, and also thinking about pellets, what pellets you use. There's different pellets on the market and you know, there's, there's, which is great, but try to make sure that you get one that doesn't have added colors and um, sweeteners that, you know, the birds just don't need. So also, of course, stay away from foods that are toxic. And think about what their diet looks like in the wild. It, you know, sometimes bark is a part of it. Sometimes, so if you have some things and they can chew off some fresh bark, you know, it may not be a bad thing. Or flowers. Um, so, and it's interesting to see birds sometimes in the wild because we may go to the grocery store and pick up that nice ripe mango, but in seeing some of the wild birds in Brazil, they would pick up fruits that were nowhere near ripe. They were unripened, but they'd be, you know, that's what they select to eat. So again, just we'll avoid dyes, dyes and preservatives. So a lot of times people say, oh yes, my birds eat fruit. They love grapes. Grapes are very high in sugar. So we don't recommend making that a normal part of the diet. You know, it's like a slice of chocolate cake for us, you know. Okay, every once in a while, but maybe not every day and maybe not a whole grape. Um, and just like with us, carbs, like wheat and pasta, you know, you want to keep in very small portions. Maybe those are incentives to get them to try something else, but not the foundation of their diet. We often hear, but he likes it, but he likes that corn chip. Well, you know, we can try to offer some other alternatives that are healthier. Sometimes we have to be the good zookeeper and make sure that they're getting good healthy foods. Okay, so just a, a quick, um, we'll, we'll have this as a download too, but because vitamin A is so important, one way that we often get birds to eat it here at the Adoption Center is by making a birdie pumpkin bread. And we use canned pumpkin. We often use a gluten-free uh, flour like a uh, you know, the garbanzo and fava bean flour, or even oat flour. Oat flour is another great way to get some calcium in there too, um, to get them eat some vitamin A. And we also have the landing mash. You know, a lot of times people think about the fresh fruits and veggies that they want to give their birds, but they don't think as much about legumes and grains. Um, and you can give different legumes and grains too. If you do feed legumes or beans, those are the one thing that you never ever want to feed raw. You want to either feed them cooked or sprouted, fully cooked or sprouted. And that's because there's some toxins in them that, you know, um, are in the raw ones that you can cook out of, or, you know, they're much better if they're cooked or sprouted. I would not give them raw. Um, but we also use this landing mash. We change the contents a good bit. We have found kamut, um, which is a grain the birds really like, and you can cook it a little bit. We usually undercook the kamut. Again, it's just a, a wheat grain, um, but it has kind of a nutty flavor to it. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of them like that. And you can then add some nice seasonings in it too and spices that that are good for them so that's just one way to give a lots lots of variety it's one of the things that is kind of a staple here at the the adoption center and think about the omegas as well so quinoa is a great source of omegas um, papitas or pumpkin seeds is another good source of omegas and some walnuts, you know, walnuts still, um, if you're going to, you know, the nuts in moderation generally, but walnuts have those good omegas in them too. So we're going to talk a little bit, or, or actually show you some wild Amazons in Brazil foraging.
So some things kind of to note there is how much work they have to go through for the food, right? And how much fun it looks like hanging upside down from one foot and, and eating a, um, you know, a bean in a pod. That's, that just looks like fun. It seems like, you know, a lot of birds love snow, flea, snow peas and sugar snap peas and those other great foods like in a pod. Um, so that can be a fun way to offer them a little foraging. And the other thing I think of, and, and it's funny that I had to go on one of the eco tours. We offer eco tours so people can go see birds on the wild and everyone pays their own way. That's a great way to learn about them. It wasn't until I saw birds for the first time in the wild that it really hit home. They need a variety of perch diameters, like real variety. Would you have put in your Amazon's cage a perch that thin? I mean, we would think about that for a finch, right? But you can always get smaller diameter perches, switch out the washers so they're nice and big and put them in the cages so they have that true diameter variety. Um, and some different options for their feet. Uh, so it's just fun to, sometimes we have to go and see birds in the wild to have those little insights, right? Okay, to the next one. Um, and of course, sleep is important. Sleep is important for all of us, right? We need good food and we need good sleep. So you want your birds to feel safe um, when they're sleeping. So that means being up high. We'll talk a little bit later on about the myth of height dominance, but being high is safe for birds. It's natural. So you want to make sure there's a nice comfortable perch up there. It could be a nice cotton rope perch if they're safe for your birds. Um, it could also be a chola wood perch that is kind of, you know, a little more comfortable. And if you are experiencing some, you know, challenges with unwanted behavior, checking, thinking about how much sleep they get and trying to increase their sleep if they don't seem to be getting enough. If you have a really active household and birds are in the middle of it, um, you know, maybe they aren't getting enough sleep. We love having birds in the middle of the flock or family, but um, if they do need more sleep, sometimes a sleep cage in another room can be a good kind of alternative for that, good option for that. And not in bed with you, of course. Um, it, I know some people, even some seasoned bird owners that, you know, it's very tempting because we're mammals and we want to cuddle and just having a bird in bed with us sounds like a good idea, but it only takes one horrible instance. You don't want, you just don't want to have that tragedy. There's so many birds have died that way. So please, 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 please do not sleep with a bird in bed with you. So that concludes the health part. Next up, we're going to talk about home being a place for safety. Um, so thank you for sticking with us and please go on to the next video momentarily.